last pitch of the 1919 World Series marked the end to what was supposed to be a great victory that would always live in the memories of the Reds players and their fans. Unfortunately, for players like Reds outfielder Ed Roush, the lasting memory would be tainted and forever questioned due to the rumors of gamblers fixing the series. There were some rumors that, you, that were evidently floating around uh, that, that the World Series might be fixed, that there were gamblers, heavy, heavy gambler involvement in the World Series and so forth. Roush and his teammates would feel cheated for the rest of their lives because their team's true greatness will never be known due to the fraudulent circumstances surrounding the 1919 World Series. Roush's performance during his tenure with the Cincinnati Reds would secure his place as the only Evansville area native inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Roush helped lead the Reds team to a National League pennant and set the stage to meet the Chicago White Sox in the World Series. Even with Roush's tremendous batting achievements during the regular season, the White Sox had outperformed the Reds in nearly every batting statistic. As a result, the White Sox were considered heavy favorites to capture the 1919 World Series crown. Not discouraged by the long odds, Roush and the Reds eventually achieved an upset victory in eight games, bringing Cincinnati its first World Series championship. Unfortunately, the 1919 World Series would not be remembered as a great Reds victory during those frigid days in October but for the greatest fix in Major League Baseball history. Of course, the White Sox had to crawl back from it, too. I mean, it just, oh, it was awful. You know, the other thing that needs to be said about that is it is often treated by the historians as a sing single event, as if suddenly gamblers came out of nowhere and convinced a team to throw a World Series. And that really is so incorrect because gambling was part of the culture in those days. I mean, there are historians who will tell you that other World Series, the gamblers have been involved <coughs> in the winning and losing of them. This one just was by far the most dramatic. And part of that was because of all the confessions that surrounded it, the player confessions, the gambler confessions. And one of the saddest things is, you know, the gamblers never suffered at all because of it. And no one of them ever went to jail, uh, Arnold Rothstein or Abatel, nobody ever went to jail. Nothing was ever done to any of the gamblers as if, oh, they were fine. <coughs> and it was just an accepted way of life until this happened. Gambling had long been associated with sports in America, and baseball was no exception. Gamblers would do what was ever necessary to win their bets. Elliot Asinoff, in his book, Eight Men Out, described occasions where gamblers would throw rocks at players attempting to field fly balls that might cost them a bet. The door to the greatest fix in Major League history was opened by Charles Albert Kaminsky, the cheap and stingy owner of the Chicago White Sox. Kaminsky routinely underpaid his players and even charged them a fee to launder their uniforms. One of the world's best natural hitters, shoeless Joe Jackson, was getting paid $6,000, while Reds outfielder Ed Roush, who was hitting 30 percentage points below Jackson, was getting paid $10,000. Third baseman Buck Weaver was getting $2,000 less than Reds third baseman Hein Groh. This bred a resentment among White Sox players. When teammate Chick Gandal was offered a large sum of money to help gamblers throw the series, he was intrigued. Gamble would become the bridge between the gambling world and seven Chicago White Sox players. Jimmy Widmeyer, an acquaintance of Roush, later informed him of a possible gambling fix. Widmeyer was a shadowy figure who ran a newsstand in Cincinnati, who always seemed to know what was going on in the gambling world. Suspicious of shifting odds, he got a room at the same hotel as the White Sox on the eve of game one. In an adjacent room, Widmeyer overheard two Chicago White Sox players, Eddie Sicotti and Oscar Happy Felsch, arguing over money they were to receive from gamblers. In game one, Roush made several spectacular catches to have one of the best games of his career. And as one reporter put it, Roush took whatever starch was left in the White Sox. When Widmeyer came to Roush with the groundbreaking news, Roush couldn't believe him. He knew that gamblers had gotten the players in the past, but he desperately wanted to believe that the Reds had won the first two games Fair and square. Jimmy told Roush about the conversations he heard and how several players from the White Sox were getting paid by gamblers to throw the games. 
Roush didn't want to believe this. He had just had the best game of his career. In game three, things seemed to turn around for the White Sox. Sox pitcher Dickie Kerr tossed a three-hit shutout to lead Chicago to a 3-0 victory in front of the hometown crowd. Heading into game four, in the best of nine series, the Reds were up two games to one. Behind strong Reds pitching, or purposefully weak Sox hitting, the Reds scored back-to-back -back shutouts in games four and five. As the series shifted back to Redland Field in Cincinnati, the Reds needed just one win to close out the series. With wins over the Reds pitchers, Slim Salee and Dutch Reeser, Widmeyer informed Roush that gamblers had gotten to some of the Reds pitchers. Because of the shifting odds and the prospects of a short series, it was believed that some of the gamblers not in on the original fix wanted to recoup some of their losses. Widmeyer explained that they asked the Reds pitchers to throw games six and seven so they could lay heavy money on the White Sox and make up for their early losses. Before game eight, Roush took his concerns to manager Pat Morant and first baseman Jake Dubart. They met with game eight starter Hot Eller to discuss a possible fix. Eller revealed that he had been approached by a man in the hotel the night before. He was approached in Chicago by a gambler who came up and told him, who followed him up on the elevator is his story. And then he walks down the hallway toward his room and the guy follows him and then the guy stops him at the, as he starts to open his door and shows him five thousand dollar bills, one thousand dollar bills, and says there are five more like this where this came from if you'll lay down tomorrow. I think that's the term, lay down tomorrow. And Hodeller says that uh, if you don't if you don't get away from me right now I'm gonna bunch to punch you on the end of the nose I think is the way it's said. And that's what he tells his manager, coach, and my granddad. Eller went out in one game eight and secured the series for the Reds. In 1921, the seven players from the White Sox were tried for conspiracy and their roles in the infamous 1919 World Series. Months before the trial, new baseball commissioner, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, went on record stating their chances of ever putting on a professional baseball uniform were very slim. Eddie Sakati was the first player to confess to the grand jury. Shoeless Joe Jackson soon followed his confession with one of his own. Shortly before the trial, signed confessions and other materials went missing. Charles Kaminsky, the owner of the White Sox, sent a telegram notifying that the seven players of an indefinite suspension as members of Major League Baseball on the first day of the trial. In the end, a lack of evidence and missing confessions led to a not guilty verdict. As a result, all seven players were banned from ever playing professional baseball again. The infamous World Series helped change the way Major League Baseball was led. In order to repair the integrity of the game and help prevent any future situations, team owners appointed the first permanent baseball commissioner, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, in 1921. In his first step to restore the image of baseball, Judge Landis banned the seven White Sox players from the game forever. While Rouse still continued to bat at an all-star level, the Reds succumbed to the constant public scrutiny and their season imploded, winning only 82 of 153 games in 1920. This performance left the World Series champions in third to last place in the National League. The scandal forever tainted the public memory of the 1919 World Series, the Chicago White Sox, and even the Cincinnati Reds. It changed the lives of all baseball players during that time including Ed Roush. In 1962, Roush was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame with notable players such as Jackie Robinson, Bob Feller, and Bill McKetney. Ed Roush is still remembered as a hardworking, classy man that brought recognition and respect to baseball in Indiana. And respect 